Ladies and gents, friends and colleagues, welcome to the 2020 Summer Webinar Series for the Telex Radio Dispatch Products. On behalf of everyone here at Bosch, we hope you are safe and healthy during this uh, uncertain time with the COVID pandemic. Again, my name is Greg Campagnon. I am the Director of Sales for North America. Um, based in Massachusetts, um, our headquarters for the Telex Radio Dispatch Products is out in Minneapolis. Um, I cover all of North America along with my sales team. Uh, some of them you, you may know out in the field. Julio Ibanez co covers the uh, southern portion of the U.S. Uh, John Anderson covers the western part of the U.S. And Craig Georgeson uh, covers the middle of the country. And rumor has it, it's Craig's birthday today. So we wanted to show a little picture of Craig here uh, and wish him a very happy, happy, healthy birthday. So happy birthday, Craig. So what are we looking at today? Some of the topics, some of the objectives, what we wanted to get through. Uh, the CSOFT software package is the industry's most flexible and capable software dispatch console system. It's perfect for any application in a dispatch environment. And we're gonna learn more about the CSOFT features, the options, the licensing, and some of its benefits. Uh, we'll get a little bit of an overview on the ADHB4 generation two audio interface, and then um, we'll take a look at uh, maybe some of the new products that are coming down the pipe. But what I'd like to do is show you um, one of our presenters today, Larry Benedict, is our senior product manager. And Larry has been in the industry for 32 years um, in the electronics industry, focused on land, mobile, radio, broadcast, and audio applications. He holds both a general audio telephone and extra class amateur radio FCC license. His 25 years here at Bosch has spanned many different roles in engineering, sales, support, marketing, and management. In addition to his 12 years, um, in addition to that, he has 12 years of experience as a volunteer EMT. He resides in Minneapolis, uh, where our headquarters is, with his wife and two children. So I'm going to hand it over to Larry next, and um, he will start us off with the session. Thanks, Greg. Well, I, I want to welcome you as well uh, as the uh, product manager, where I have worldwide responsibility for this this business. It is a North American focused business, so uh, I'm very in tuned to what's going on here in the United States and in Canada. Um, but we do have operations all over the world. Um, just a quick overview, uh, Telex Dispatch, I think a lot of you know this already, but um, we've been a part, fully integrated with Bosch in 2009. We were actually acquired in late 2006, but it took a couple of years to uh, get us completely into the Bosch fold. We've got a long history. We've been controlling radios for about 55 years, a little over that, uh, originally starting out as Vega. Uh, some of you may may recall Vega uh, out in California. Uh, we brought the first IP radio gateway to market in 2003. And uh, that was really revolutionary at the time when that came out because all of the previous wireline interfaces had uh, basically relied on radio loops um, to, to interconnect uh, sites together. And uh, we actually... Uh, implemented a way of doing it over IP, and I know there were a lot of people back then that were a little bit leery of doing it that way, and now that is the industry standard. Um, so we were quite proud of the fact that we were the, the first to, to do so. Um, we have over 30,000 IP console systems sold to date. Um, we we actually run that number, and, and uh, so that's a, a rough number. It's always climbing. It's kind of like uh, McDonald's, you know, how many serve. We have the most radio interfaces available, whether that's uh, a direct digital IP interface or one of the many, many radios that we can interface in through our IP224 radio gateway. And we have systems installed in all of the major verticals. And then if you get into those major verticals and start looking at sub-verticals, we can pretty much point to just about every sub-vertical as well. So uh, we really span the breadth from everything from, you know, small police departments and, and uh, enterprise uh, companies to things like the, the St. Lawrence Seaway or the Panama Canal. Our, our equipment, our systems, our software is what makes things like that roll. 
And now I'd like to, to uh, introduce uh, Greg Donaski, who um, is our Senior Application Specialist. Sometimes uh, I refer to him as our Applications Engineer because that's the, the world I originally came from. Greg has over 36 years experience in the electronics uh, industry, um, with six years of that spent in the Navy, um, and 30 years uh, here with Bosch Security Systems. So he basically went from the Navy to what is now Bosch. He, he is the longest serving Vega employee, to my knowledge, that we have. Um, he came from California, um, but he now resides in Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, with his uh, wife and, and two kids where we have our engineering and our manufacturing operations. And he too, like myself, has had a wide uh, experience with sales, engineering, system design, installation, training. Many of you know him as a trainer, as well as operations of systems. So with that, Greg, I'll turn it over to you. Well, welcome everyone. And uh, uh, thanks for tuning in to uh, this uh, webinar about uh, um, our core products. Uh, one of our core products, uh, Seasoft. So Seasoft is a uh, GUI or Windows application. The possibilities are endless. It's really up to um, you, the installer or the end user, to customize the screen to fit your uh, requirement. Um, there are no two uh, systems that seem to, to look alike. Um, it's really up to uh, you and how much time you invest in uh, the, the functionality you want to present to your operators. Um, it can be as simple as trying to mimic or as close to mimicking your existing system so you can decrease your um, training time. Um, and as complex as multiple screens and, uh, or tabs, um, those kind of scenarios. So, it is a, a pretty uh, uh, flexible platform, as uh, uh, everybody has said before. It's uh, really up to um, what you need to get accomplished and how uh, intricate you want to uh, uh, make the operations uh, to the dispatcher. Uh, it can be very simple. So CSoft is uh, uh, scalable. We sell it uh, uh, from two to 200 line, or audio resources, as we might like to call it. The dispatch positions are unlimited. It's just an IP address on the network. Um, we have some systems as small as one or two, and we have other systems as you know big as multiple hundreds uh, 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 within a facility or not a facility, but within a campus or a corporate environment. Again, uh, the user interface is customizable and flexible. Um, there are many ways to skin a cat, and it's quite interesting to see how everybody does it as part of um, the higher levels of tech support. I get to see lots of designs when people have questions about stuff, and it's always interesting to see how people have uh, um, deployed uh, the application. We uh, uh, support multiple vocoders, so you can use uh, different bandwidth based on the types of uh, uh, WAN or LAN connections out to the endpoints. And they're programmable per line. So if you've got one line that's a satellite link that you want to use the least amount of bandwidth, and you've got another line that's local and you want to use uh, the highest quality of audio, that's all supported. Um, since it is Windows, touchscreen, mouse, foot switch, trackball, any type of uh, uh, user interface uh, is pretty uh, pretty much supported. Um, the uh, System will support up to uh, six speakers when you're using an ADHB4. Um, the key to the speakers is they're also just standard PC speakers. There's nothing unique about our speaker systems. Um, you want a little more sound, or you want to use the sound that's embedded in the uh, monitor system, you can use that as a set of speakers. So there's nothing unique about our speakers. Uh, displays single or multi uh, monitor installs. I mean, you've seen us at trade shows with 50 plus inch monitors. It's, you can have multiple 24 inch monitors. It's really up how you want to install Seesaw. Microphones, we or, uh, offer a number of gooseneck, desk mic, and uh, headsets. Um, there's also a number of, uh, you know, out there third party standard dispatcher uh, uh, style headsets that will easily plug into our devices. Um, CSOF will support a uh, ANI alias table of uh, 6,000 users. 
So if an A and I number comes in, it will cross reference it over. So one, two, three, four could be uh, you know truck twenty one. Um, each line within CSoft um, can be a dedicated frequency, or in some cases, if you have a multi freak radio or you want to um, switch between talk groups with inside that radio, each line can support up to a thousand talk uh, or channels uh, when you're using an IP224. Um, CSoft can support up to 30 concurrent cross patches. So you can have uh, two lines patched in one patch and a number of lines in another patch, but you can configure up to 30 cross patches with inside CSoft. What is a cross patch? Typically, it's radio to radio or radio to phone. If somebody wants to do a phone to phone, typically you're going to leverage the phone system to create a conference bridge and not through CSoft. Um, CSoft offers SIP uh, telephony. Two, uh, two lines of any of the licenses can be configured to be a SIP extension, and we also uh, offer expansions to uh, six or 12 extensions. Uh, as part of the licensing. So other things we can do, paging, two-tone paging, uh, DTMF, NOx, stack, cap code, all of those kinds of pages are uh, supported. Signaling formats, if you're still in uh, using some analog, you can do uh, MDC or Fleet Sync or DTMF. Um, some of the older systems uh, with IP223 supported 5.6 tone. We have uh, proline call histories, active emergency, emergency history. There's a number of information windows that can pop up. You can have multiple clocks, VU meters, PTT indication. Uh, we, um, by default, CSOFT has supported an IR instant recall recorder for um, the last 10 minutes. You can have a, a global call history, which will support 10 minutes worth of um, uh, the last calls throughout the whole line, or you can even have instant recall buttons. Uh, you press them and hold them down, and for the last 10 or 20 seconds, you can hear the select or unselect or any one of the speakers, depending on how it's configured. Intercom, you can intercom between consoles or to remote tower sites. Alert tones, uh, a number of different alert tones that are programmable. Enunciations, you could have pre-recorded pre wave files and um, play those WAV files, press one button, play a, a WAV file, you know, seek cover, uh, adverse weather in, you know, is in the area. Those kind of things could be keyed up and go over the air. Uh, programmed group and mute buttons, you press one button, it selects a number of lines to talk on, press a different button, it can mute a number of lines so you don't hear the audio. There's a keypad so you can select users. Um, uh, for doing private call um, and uh, uh, other operations. So there's a, a, a user keypad and it even comes uh, uh, with a manual um, search engine in it. So optional features. So CSOF, you know, typically it's uh, IP223, IP 224 lines with a control station. Um, or SIP lines, that is pretty much the default. Now, if you want to use some uh, of the other features, there is a P25 DFSI for conventional uh, P25 systems. We have a P25 CSSI for trunk systems option. We have a P25 encryption doing uh, FIPS uh, 142 and uh, uh, 256 AES or DES encryption, and that can be configured for both the DFSI or CSSI lines. We have a ProLine call playback option. It allows the last hour on any specific line to be recorded to a secondary drive or to a network location. Um, one line is included with each line of uh, uh, CSOS. We'll cover a little more about that. There's SIP to left company. We already talked about that. Two extensions with any license size. There's a DMR AIS direct IP interface for DMR systems that support AIS. A next edge uh, direct IP for conventional and trunked next edge systems. And then we also have an API option to allow you to connect CSOFT to a third party, uh, CAD or any other kind of applications to allow them to talk together. 
So P25 DFSI, it's a, uh, it meets the TIA standards. Um, it's sold in increments of 2, 6, 12, or 24. Those are uh, enablers, so all of our options uh, enable the core line of a CSOF license. So you would need, uh, if you have a 12-line license, up to 12 lines could be enabled if you were to purchase the 12-line option um, uh, for DFSI. And I'm not going to go down the list. You guys can see the, the whole number of features that are supported. Um, P25 uh, uh, trunk system. Uh, we have the CSSI interface. Again, same, uh, same concept for uh, um, puck groups. If you uh, want to listen to six puck groups, you would have a six line uh, uh, enabler in your licensing. And the number of features uh, or a number of features are supported group, private call. Um, the functions do vary with the system that we're trying to connect to. Um, so whether it's a, a, a tape trunk system or a Motorola trunk system or a Harris trunk system, you will see um, some of these uh, uh, capabilities vary. Uh, there's the encryption option. Uh, and the keys are uh, loaded onto each CSoft. Uh, we use, uh, we can support up to 100 keys into 50 profiles, and we typically attach the uh, Tate Recon or a Motorola KVL um, uh, key loader to the computer and load the keys in that way. Uh, Proline call playback, talked about that uh, a few minutes ago. So one line is included. It allows you to record the last uh, hours worth of RX and uh, TX traffic on that line. Uh, you have the ability to pin a call so it doesn't get uh, written over. So any call that expires or meets that one hour, it's going to be uh, basically written over. Um, but you can pin it. You can also make comments to uh, a file if you needed to go back and look at it. And it's uh, sold uh, or uh, allows an option to expand it to 2, 6, 12, 24, 50, or 100 lines if you wanted to uh, uh, record up to 100 uh, disparate lines with inside your system, and that's per position. And uh, the lines are defined at the designer level of CSOFT. So uh, once it's defined and uh, the design is running, that's where the audio files, or that's the lines the audio files are recorded for. SIP, um, so we have a SIP module inside CSOFT. Basically, it brings in a soft phone um, to uh, uh, the operator, we allow them to wear one headset, talk on a phone, talk on radio. Um, it has a 5,000 uh, speed uh, dial uh, with multiple phone books. Once the phone call is initiated, you could cross patch it to a radio channel. Um, and there's a number of other things like per line call history. Um, you can uh, expand and uh, see the contacts and forward and miss calls. And, there's a number of tabs in there, and you, again, can expand it to six or 12 extensions per console. Typically, with the way SIP, SIP servers work, you wouldn't use 12 extensions um, because you're only on one call at a time. The other call that you might have been on would automatically go on hold when you answer a new call. Um, and typically with... Um, uh, dial out or uh, ring groups that can be programmed into SIP uh, extensions uh, or SIP inbound line, uh, routing, you can make any every console ring when one inbound call comes in. So other features, there's your typical features, place receive calls, call hold, call waiting, call transfer, um, you know, three-way conferencing. So those are all functions that are built into the module. DMR AIS, um, same concept as we have with uh, DFSI or CSSI. You, um, uh, these are options uh, to enable lines with inside your CSOF license to talk to a DMR system. And uh, um, the, uh, uh, well, how you want to put this? The options to the best of my knowledge, uh, all of these features work across the number of 
uh, uh, tested DMR systems that we've tested. So um, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, same thing for Next Edge. Um, again, again, it's uh, a conventional or trunk systems. We support both. Uh, you can configure the line to be narrow or very narrow spacing. It supports the Kenwood 15-bit encryption, broadcast, group, unit calls, emergencies, uh, uh, GPS uh, decode. So there's a number of, uh, of options uh, out there for the uh, Next Edge too. And then again, the CSoft uh, API. CSoft API uh, um, uses uh, I, uh, an IP connection to connect the, the third-party app or the, um, to CSoft. It's encrypted, uh, user authenticated, and there's a number of features that are supported and the list constantly grows as um, new uh, uh, customers pick up on uh, the option and, oh, it would be nice if it did this, this. So features get added as part of uh, uh, the continued growth to the API app. So CSOF uh, 7, uh, I didn't start with 7.0, I ran out of space, but as you can see, CSOF is constantly under uh, evolution. New things are added all the time. Um, I'll just leave it at that. 7.6 is our latest version, and um, the biggest thing that it offers is the ADHB4 Gen 2's uh, uh, audio controls for the new AUX input. Um, and then there's a number of other small enhancements that happened as part of that release. But as you can see, there's always something uh, going on, and we typically have one to two releases a, a year um, for the uh, Seesaw 7 series. Um, Seesaw 6.5 is uh, the last version of the a hardware key, um, and it's just uh, uh, there's no, nothing that gets done to that version other than uh, occasional customer support. So. Typically, you know, there's your, your average dispatch position, uh, monitor, PC, ADHB4, speakers, a microphone, keyboard mount. Where can you install them? Um, supervisor's desk, district, regional. It's purely up to um, your design. Uh, CSOF can be designed. Um, you know, you could have 50 radio resources and you can have numerous CSOF designs with inside that and you can define, okay, supervisor has all 50 resources, maybe the district only got 12 resources, uh, um, shift changes are all supported, you know, backup centers, uh, the licensing supports a lot of that, and we'll go into that in, here in a few more minutes. Um, it's really up to uh, uh, the flexibility of CSOFT and how you can define the screen and how you wanna, uh, um, what kind of resources you wanna give to um, the individual user. So, CSOF licensing, uh, we fundamentally changed about five years ago to an electronic license versus a hardware license. Um, a lot of people still like the hardware. There's a lot of flexibility that comes in the software that they may not understand. Um, uh, uh, and it's quite a, a, a more, you, once I explain it to some people, they go, oh, and, and this is hopefully will help you guys understand what you can do with Seesaw 7 licensing if you haven't already explored it. So it supports multiple scenarios, um, and we'll go over those. You can install um, licenses on an individual PCs like you've always done with a hardware key, but it also supports uh, uh, servers you could install your licenses on multiple servers, and uh, as the PC activates and they want to launch CSoft, it will go out to a server address and get an available license. So there's some value in that, and I'll, I'll go over that in a few minutes. We support the mixing of uh, licenses. Um, so you can have 50 line licenses, you can have 24 line licenses, you can have the options. All of a sudden, somebody needs to run BFSI or DMR. All of those things, they can all be presented or posted up onto the uh, uh, server. And when the CSOF launches, it's only going to grab the license it needs. 
So it doesn't take, oh, I only need a 12 line license, but I found a 50. If there's a 12 line license on the server or 24 in this scenario, it's only gonna take the minimum necessary license it needs, allowing somebody else a bigger license or the licenses they need. So it doesn't, um, it doesn't take licensing that it doesn't require to operate the design it's trying to launch. So that's quite, that makes it uh, a, a lot more flexible. So if you have regional centers and you wanna post all the licenses in one spot and you have a very small regional office that only needs a six line, when they go to the server, it's only gonna take a six. It's still gonna leave the bigger line license counts to someone else. So the ability to mix all of this together is what's really unique about Seesaw 7 license. So our scenario one, three positions, 12 lines. I wanna install 12 lines on each position. I'm gonna order three individual licenses at 12 and install it on one line on each PC. Not much different than you would have done with the Seasoft dongle hardware key. Um, you would have installed Seasoft and then stuck the key into the a USB. Problem is the USB keys we have found, uh, uh, they are electronic, so they do fail over time. People take them thinking they're a USB drive or something. People knock into them, they break them off. So there's a number of things that have happened over the years that um, do make the hardware key uh, a, a little bit of a, a problem. Our next scenario, we want uh, three positions, each one with 12 lines, but I wanna install them on a server. My server can be a physical VM PC in the back room if I wanted to, or it can be one of my positions. And um, I can install the license on that one PC and the other two clients go to that PC and get a license. It can be as simple as that. Okay, forgot to press the button. Um, license scenario number three. Let's say I've got a much bigger operation. I got 22 positions. I wanna, uh, and they're all gonna be 12 lines. I've decided that I wanna hard code a couple of positions with their dedicated license, and those are my standalones. I'm gonna order 22 individual entitlements of 12. I'm gonna install 20 of them on the server, and I'm gonna put two of them hard onto the standalone PCs. They're not reliant on the server for uh, connectivity. So that's one of the beauties. The last one is I wanna install my licenses on two servers. So if for whatever reason my first server fails, I have a backup server with additional licenses. I'm gonna install uh, order 20 individual entitlements and I'm gonna put 10 on each license. The beauty to it is CSoft can be configured or programmed to have two IP addresses in the uh, uh, license server uh, location, or they can be the PC name on the network. One of the beauties to server addresses is, I'm gonna go back here. Some of those clients could actually be remote and we have an app note or a, a little note written on that. They could be remote and not have to have, you could put CSoft in the lice or the uh, uh, design file on a laptop. Somebody in today's climate could be working remotely from home or another secure location, get into the network through some uh, uh, tunneling, VPN type tunnel devices, and use one of the licenses that's residing on the server. So this saves you from having to make sure that every PC that somebody's working remote or dispatching remotely has to have a license. No, the same licenses that would be used in your dispatch center can be used remotely if they're not being used in your dispatch center. So that is one of the big um, savers to the electronic license and putting the uh, uh, licenses on a server. And here's how the server works. Basically every 30 seconds, the position sends a keep my license assigned to me. Uh, and if after three of those uh, uh, heartbeats or keep alives are not sent to the server, the server will release that license for that person, allowing someone else to then uh, acquire the license. Okay. 
the uh, other thing during testing is if uh, um, you've lost, you were up and running on uh, uh, one server and the server uh, uh, were to um, go down or the connection to that server goes down, Keysoft will automatically try the secondary uh, um, server address in its programming to see if there's an available license before it comes up and says uh, uh, the licensing has, uh, uh, I'm unable to uh, keep my license active. So we'll go into real quick on the HB4. Uh, this is the HB4 Gen 2, which we uh, reduced or re released, I'm sorry, uh, late last year. Um, we were forced to uh, uh, redesign the HB4. The uh, front panel display had gone end of life on us. So we decided to shift over to uh, an existing display most people were accustomed to, which is the display from the IP224. So we redesigned the front to use the IP224 display, moved uh, a lot of the mechanics over to uh, um, uh, operations that technicians are quite familiar with, with the HB4. And then we released a new RHB2 to go with it. Um, for anybody who's familiar with the HB4 uh, Gen 1 or Gen 2, it connects to the PC using USB cable. Uh, uh, it's programmed uh, via the Ethernet uh, um, and firmware updated uh, using Ethernet and TSM. Uh, there is no audio packets that go through the Ethernet, so it doesn't need to be connected unless you want to manage them. Uh, change configurations and uh, uh, do firmware updates. There's a dual quarter inch jack on the side of the unit for the uh, for headsets and we have a number of XLR and desk mic jacks uh, on the unit. A NINA IO jack for anybody who needs to bring in a, a 911 compliant phone using a NINA port. Uh, we can support up to three uh, amplified uh, standard PC speaker sets giving you a total of six speakers. And there's two relays, uh, Form C relays out, two aux inputs in. There's analog recorder outs, foot switch inputs, uh, the clock updates from the PC time. So uh, occasionally you'll get a call, hey, how come my ADHB4 is off? Uh, well, look at the clock on the time on your PC because it's where it's getting its time from. Um, the main difference between a new and an old unit is the remote headset boxes are now connected using standard RJ45s, and we've tested up to, uh, I've tested up to a 15-foot cable. Uh, I think we'll even say 25-foot is max. That's, you know, a lot easier than the old uh, uh, DB9 serial cables that we used to use that were uh, much more expensive and a little harder to get when you got beyond seven feet. Um, again, uses the same display as an IP224. The new feature to it is we added the aux input. Now you can bring in uh, audio from the PC, or if you had some sound distribution system within uh, our sound distribution panel at a dispatch position and you had in a, a, a command center or an operation center and you had multiple TV sets up on walls and the dispatcher wanted to hear what was on screen two versus screen three or four, you could then select which one of those you wanted to route to the headset uh, uh, through the back jack of the HB4. Uh, not much different, I, I think, of uh, when I plug my headset in and you're at uh, uh, Planet Fitness and there's all the screens and you say, I want to hear the audio from TV screen six. So same concept. And the RHB1 uh, uh, Gen 2 also supports a hook switch. So anybody who gets one of the new RHB1s We'll see a new three-pin terminal block. You can wire in a hook switch, uh, mechanical hook switch, hook switch for a handset. So if you lifted the handset out, it would actually uh, route uh, um, that you've now gone off hook. So each ADHB4 can support two remote headset boxes. That hasn't changed. Whenever you purchase the new ADHB4 Gen 2 or a remote headset box, Gen 2, we actually supply adapters that allow you to backwards compatible with an existing unit. So if you had some RHB1 uh, from the first one, but you needed to replace the ADHB4, it would come with adapters allowing you to um, convert 
uh, from one to the other. And likewise for the RHB ones to the original uh, ADHBs. So the front panel, we've got our menu button, accesses the programming. The escape button to back up or ex uh, escape programming. Uh, LED, uh, the push to talk LED, anytime one of the push to talk uh, uh, inputs are pressed, that LED will go uh, red. We've got uh, the up button, so that's a headset volume up or an up function when you're in programming mode. The down, headset down or down function in programming mode. And then we've got a link LED, so the link LED uh, is a, uh, a Ethernet indication of uh, connectivity uh, to the network. So it's a real easy way is if, without having to get behind the unit, is it even plugged into the network. Rear of the unit, got our USB port, our 10 uh, by 100 Ethernet port, foot switch jack, accessory port. Again, that's all your analog uh, record outs, your aux in uh, as far as logic and your relay outs. We've got a NINA jack. We've got a NINA phone jack. Um, typically, I would say that's if you're going to have a phone terminal that has a headset port, you can do a headset cable between the two, and you can uh, get audio out of the phone system that way. Here's our new RHB uh, one in uh, ports for headset or number one and number two port. Our new aux in jack, which is a, a eighth inch stereo. Our RJ12 uh, desk mic jack, our speakers, and then our power jack. Side view, we've got our three pin XLR that can support uh, phantom power. And then we've got, uh, uh, if you've got phantom power turned on, you'll have a visual indication that there's power for that port or headset jack, and then a uh, headset polarity uh, hash mark. Some of the Telex headsets, especially the ones that have ANR, uh, the mic bias pin for the ANR circuitry uh, is based on uh, the headset jack being plugged in correctly. The ADHB4 uh, can be mounted above or below the desk. We sell an optional mount kit. It's also strong enough to support the heaviest monitor we know, uh, which used to be the older ELOs. Uh, we've uh, weight tested it to 30 plus pounds. Um, so it's uh, an all steel box. For people who don't know what the NINA is, uh, NINA, basically 911 phone system, and they'll have typically some, uh, the terminology might change, but radio telephone headset interface, which basically is balanced audio in and out and logic. Um, so they'll close the ground um, to us, indicating that there is a phone call active, and then the ADHB4 will then route uh, mic to the phone system and audio from the phone system to the dispatcher's headset um, select audio, the selective radio traffic will then route to a speaker and the dispatcher only hears the um, uh, uh, phone call in the headset. Our uh, new PC, which is uh, projected to be hopefully here later September. This is our uh, new guy that replaces our existing, uh, um, or the, uh, our previously uh, unit, our uh, previous 4108, as we called it, the uh, Kohler machine. Um, basic specs, 16 gig of RAM, i5 motherboard. It's got a 256 um, gigabyte solid state for the OS and the applications. It's got a one terabyte uh, hard drive in it for audio file storage. Uh, supports dual monitors, multiple USB uh, uh, ports. Uh, dual NIC ports. Um, we're going to supply it with a wireless keyboard or mouse. It uh, comes with preloaded software. The only thing you have to do basically is add your design and your CSOF license. Um, it comes instead of uh, a Cronus, which is the old recovery software we used to use. We're going to uh, uh, Seneca backup and restore. The beauty of that software, and I'll cover it in a minute, kind of out of out of play here. Um, this unit is just slightly bigger than the uh, existing uh, Kohler, if you're uh, used to that guy. The big plus to it is it's fanless. This is one huge 
heavy heat sink and all the heat dissipates. Um, it's fanless, there's no noise. Um, and comes with, uh, you can either mount on a desktop, it will come with a Vista mount if you wanted to mount it to the uh, tool wall or to the back of a big monitor. Uh, comes with inline power supply, uh, UL and energy level six. Um, it's probably the most tested PC we've ever had um, to get to this level. Um, so it's UL, uh, CE, and FCC for emissions. So onto the Seneca. The beauty of the Seneca is it supports the ability to factory recover. You can uh, create, take it back to the way we delivered it. You can create system backups. After you've done a number of changes, done firmware update, added re, uh, your licensing, you can create a restore point. You can save it on the, uh, the internal D drive if you want. You could even save it to a network drive. You can create new images. So after you get the machine and you want to do something uh, 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 slightly different from the way we delivered it, you can make those changes. And then you can also restore at any time. So it's, it's a much more flexible platform and we've got um, an application note all ready to go with, uh, with it once we start to ship the units. Um, and then you have the ability to reboot from a factory image or to a system backup. So always keep the latest system backups since, you know, um, you'll keep them on a thumb drive or a, a network drive just in case something were to happen. So again, I want to, on behalf of everyone, I want to thank you all for showing up this week. And uh, stay safe out there. And any questions that you have regarding our products, feel free to give us a contact uh, call, and we'll be happy to help you out. Have a great rest of your day, and thanks for joining us. Thanks, guys.